All right, ladies and gentlemen, what's happening? I'm here with John Fallis. He is a Bitcoiner and he's also on a spiritual journey. He runs uh, one of the most successful podcasts in the Bitcoin game called, called Bitcoin Rapid Fire. And um, I've heard some amazing interviews on that channel. So make sure you go check it out. I wanted to have John on the show to talk about spirituality, about hallucinogens, about uh, Bitcoin, and really just th this new sort of uh, genre that's opening up, which is uh, transformation work, hallucinogens, Bitcoin, and health all together, all in one conglomeration of, of well-being. <laughs> so, so welcome, John. Well, Josh, thanks, man. It's, uh, you know, I really appreciate the invite to come and speak with you and everything you just said made me smile. And it, it's interesting, you know, uh, part of this quote unquote community that's coalescing, much of which interacts on Twitter is actually starting to, you know, as you say, these are somewhat, uh, you, you, you wouldn't necessarily think that those sorts of things would line up or match. You know, you got spirituality on the one hand, you've got kind of hardcore economic, you know, principles wrapped up in Bitcoin. And then you've got, you know, different schools of philosophy and stuff like that. And it's at, at first glance, it seems weird that they're all kind of converging. But I think the grander story that's happening is that um, this is uh, kind of the emergence of a new, you know, I know this is a very uh, bold statement, but the emergence of kind of a new individual, like what does a sovereign individual look like? And how do they manage their health? What's their approach to spirituality? What's their approach to, uh, approach to money and finance? And then, of course, the interesting questions are, how do each of these pursuits, whether they be, um, you know, working with the plant medicines or whether they be understanding and engaging in Bitcoin, to what degree and how, how do these, uh, these different domains and these different tools actually facilitate sovereignty and freedom and, and, and those sorts of things? And that's the real juicy bits that I like to get into on my pods. And uh, I'm looking forward to the chat. Yes, perfectly said. There's a teacher named Meyer Ezra who talks about how you can't be spiritual if you're hungry. So for all of the people who are broke trying to make ends meet, it's like they don't even have the luxury of being spiritual per se. But when finances are in order and business is in order, he actually always teaches people how to create a business before he takes people in, onto a spiritual path so that all of that is in order. And then they can take all of their time to give back, to grow, to change um, the world. And that's even kind of what Mother Teresa did. You know, she wanted tons of money so that she could change the world, um, so that she could be spiritual. <laughs> so, so I always bring money into the equation with like my clients and my channel because a lot of people in the spiritual path sort of go against money. Uh, they think that it's somehow wrong because, you know, it's used for poor purposes around the world. Um, but as Breedlove says, right, it's amoral, right? It's, it's neither good nor bad, but it's a tool. And I love to create abundance uh, for myself and for everyone around me. Like that's, it's kind of our birthright, I feel, that for us to be radically abundant, have everything we need. Do you agree with, with that? Yeah, I totally agree. And I think this, yeah, absolutely. And the system, you know, on the last point, the system that we uh, live in today is a huge suppressant on that because it's actually stifling people's ability to have an abundant life by siphoning off so much of their wealth and productivity, you know, at, uh, uh, you know, from the source effectively. And that's through the money that they're forced to interact and engage and transact with, you know, so that's a huge disservice to humanity and to individuals that are uh, seeking that level of freedom. And it's, you know, it's keeping them on the hamster wheel longer and it's making the journey of, of having that type of sovereignty and freedom a lot more difficult than it ought to be. You know, it's basically it's making their life far less abundant than it otherwise could be. And to the former point, um, you know, I, I totally agree. I've spent my time, you know, backpacking through all the, you know, for lack of a better term, hippie havens and spiritual enclaves and stuff like that, you know, in Thailand and in uh, the Amazon and in various par parts of South America and Europe and um, you know, you encounter that mindset a lot where these people kind of have been so put off by, you know, the nature of the world, how the, how the, the, the society as it exists today operates and the greed and the malevolence and all the rest of it. And they kind of reject it in favor of 
carving out a little enclave, whether it be in Bali or in Chiang Mai or in Tulum or in somewhere in the Amazon. And uh, I think that rejection uh, ultimately it does them a disservice because, you know, you can't hold back the tide. You can't hide from these things forever. There's an economic reality to life and there's an economic reality to civilization. And um, just acting like it's not there and kind of being lovey-dovey with your, with your hippie friends 24-7 and acting like that's the real world, um, you know, it can be the real world for a time. And there's a lot of be beautiful sentiments and relationships that you can create there. But, you know, ignoring a huge part of reality rarely is beneficial for someone. So I, I, I love how Bitcoin is reframing what money is and what economics are and what trade is. And um, that's helping people to overcome their biases towards the more, you know, the, the negative aspects, many of which have sprung from the type of money we've been using for the last several generations and helping them reframe what all this is about and that money can actually be a tool for liberation rather than oppression. Totally. There's a f three different sort of lines that I want to take after you say that. And um, the first thing I want to ask is if you could share with us a little bit about your personal journey, because you're always interviewing other people and bringing out their personal stories. But I'd love to hear how you got into spirituality and, and, and then eventually how you got into Bitcoin and how this world kind of merged together for you. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll give the Coles Notes version, but um, was always a, a hyper curious sort of kid. You know, I, I tell you a funny story. So uh, my family had a house fire in 2005. And so all of our all of my worldly goods were boxed up then. And then I ended up living in, in China for 10 years. So I've been living away for for all that time. And um, I, I'm a home right now. And we recently uh, got all of that stuff out of storage because my, my parents are moving into a new home. And uh, I got one of my old boxes from my room and I found this love letter that I'd written this girl in grade three, right? And the letter itself was hilarious, but I, I, can't, I can't recall exactly the contents now. If I had it here, I'd read it to you. But the punchline was I wrote her name on the envelope in Egyptian hieroglyphics, right? So that was kind of like the kid I was. That probably, that's probably says a lot about the kid mm -hmm. I was. Always a little bit odd, I guess. But um, yeah, you know, I had the opportunity to travel a lot when I was younger. Um, you know, went to uh, Nepal with my dad to do some trekking in the Himalayas when I was 17, 18. And, you know, looked into a lot of Eastern, uh, you know, practices and religious traditions at the time, like Buddhism and meditation and that kind of stuff. Um, got into psychedelics. Um, mistakenly, you know, started off recreationally with a few of my buddies. We were just meant to kind of have some tea and, and have a funny night, a giggle fest, and uh, ended up m mixing up the dose and taking too much and having a really challenging experience that night, but one that set my mind and my curiosity on fire because once I got over how difficult it was, I was like, holy shit, there is something that needs to be investigated here. So on, I went down that rabbit hole and that was probably in, in 2006, 2007, um, followed that rabbit hole all the way to, uh, the Amazon where I, you know, spent a few months and had a number of ayahuasca ceremonies and went up to the Andes and had, had a number of San Pedro ceremonies. Um, and then I, from there, I booked a one-way ticket to China because inside of me, there was still like, even though after all of that, I had started to feel very differently about um, the world and you know what I wanted to, mm -hmm. to do and see in it. I, you know, when I was in high school, I was also kind of like a economics geek. I was reading, you know, Graham, um, Benjamin Graham security analysis, all of Warren Buffett's books. Like I thought I want to make money and the way to make money is to be in finance sort of thing. And there was still an element to that. So I, I thought China was the future. I thought Shanghai was the center of that. So I booked a one way ticket and, uh, you know, basically, I, I'm a diehard UFC fan. My second month there, I was staying at a hostel, and I uh, I met this guy. He he actually helped. It was in a forum. He actually helped me determine where the UFC fight was going to be shown. I show up with this crazy Brazilian guy from the the hostel I was staying at, and I'm sitting. The guy I'm sitting next to, we start chatting, and it turns out he was the guy who helped me in the forum. And it also turned out that he was the HR manager for the largest wealth management uh, firm in the city at that time. And I told him, well, I was looking for a gig in that domain. And so I got that job and worked in that capacity for three years, really hated it, kind of soul destroying work. I'll, you know, just sell, 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 no, no consideration for 
the clients at all. And um, then I actually got into natural medicine. I went back into the three-year program uh, and did natural medicine. And then I, in Shanghai, I practiced at a clinic for two years there. Somewhat of a similar story, just in that it was very sales driven. And I, you know, I really, I didn't like how the clinic operated. And then I, um, I left that in, in 18, did some traveling, met a girl in Thailand and uh, was in Thailand ever since basically. I, I, I bought an RV and, and toured around Europe for a little while and then went back to Thailand and lived there until uh, I came back at Christmas and basically got stuck here since COVID kicked off. And the Bitcoin element of that story is I can't remember the year, but it was on my radar very early because I remember the hullabaloo around it becoming uh, p- reaching parity with the US dollar. I know how hilarious that sounds today, but I remember that time. And uh, the, 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 the other touch point was my friend and I, we were, you know, psychonauts, very much going down that rabbit hole. And we wanted to source some DMT and the, the Silk Road was the market where you got that at the time and Bitcoin was the currency in which they transacted. Now we never did it because we just pushed out and we didn't want to deliver DMT to our, you know, our homes or mailboxes or whatever. Um, and then, you know, I started listening to Andreas videos in probably 2013 and then on a trip to Bali in 14, um, I was, I went to the co-working place there was supposed to meet. Uh, I met a girl there. They just finished a talk on Bitcoin. And I was like, damn it, you know, like I really wanted to learn more. And she said, oh, have dinner with you and your girlfriend, have dinner with me and my boyfriend tomorrow night, and we'll talk all about it and get you set up and everything. I thought, amazing. Emailed her. She never responded. So that dinner never happened. And then a couple of days later, I was down in the, the coastal part of uh, Bali, and they actually had a Bitcoin store where you could just go in and give them cash, and they would help get you all set up with a wallet and buy Bitcoin. And so uh, that was my first touch with Bitcoin. And then I was, you know, pretty infatuated with ever since. But what I've noticed, you know, with the, 20, the 2020 class is that now because of all the information, all the podcasts, the books, the writers, the, and of course the adoption and the price, it's you, people fall so much quicker down the rabbit hole now. So my, my progression was much slower, um, but I started interviewing people in the space in 2015 as a, as a total hobby. And then in 2019, I just decided there's too much activity going on. I want to, and there's too many great people in the space to to not do more of it. So I've been doing a lot of it since then. And uh, man, I got to tell you, it's like, you, I'm, I'm a, you know what the psychedelic rabbit hole is like, right? I mean, it's just forever expands your idea of what reality is and what consciousness is and all, all the rest of that stuff. And it, it, it's so juicy for someone who's a curious person and it, you know, endless questions and refinement as you go through it and as you have these experiences. And for me, Bitcoin is like that, but in the physical world, you know, in a, in a, in a way that, you know, um, you know, it's, it's super relevant for how the world functions, but the rabbit hole depth is, is very similar. I find to, to Bitcoin and the meaning or to psychedelics and the meaning of it all is, is equally powerful. So uh, I just find myself on fire pretty much at all times uh, learning about and engaging and communicating these ideas and these concepts and this phenomenon and what it means for uh, society and humanity uh, to anyone who cares to listen. So if you're, if you're within earshot of me, I'm probably going on about it at some point uh, during the day. So it's uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's the short story. (laughs) Beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. What is it that makes Bitcoin such, so magnetic, so, such a grounding rod, you know, for me, it's such a grounding rod right now during a time of, of chaos. And it's like, I think about it all the time. (laughs) I'm constantly thinking about it, constantly researching it. And, you know, I, I, I've, I've never really, aside from jujitsu and ayahuasca and these other things that, um, that I did, like, I've never really fixated on something so intensely, you know? And, um, I would love to, for you to just start sharing about Bitcoin. What, what is it? What does it mean to you? And I'll just start going in with questions as, as you go on a rant uh, for my people. Sure. Well, I think one of the relevant points is the reason why I think it has that pull is because, you know, few things are more relevant than money, right? Money is how you survive. Money is your tether to all the things that you want. Money is the ultimate optionality. You know, it's kind of a form of magic, right? Like, Anything else, this cup 
you know, can't be turned into much. I got to meet somebody who wants this cup in order for it to facilitate anything other than its use that I use it for. But money is, you know, is a, is the ultimate in optionality. So of all the things that we have in the world, money is the thing that turns into the most other things. You know, you can look at it in, in that way. And, uh, you know, as a result, not only does it manifest the world around us, but it's also the thing that we receive for our sacrifice, for this expenditure of our time and our energy, those two things that we can never get back as time moves forward and as we degrade over time. Um, you know, that money is the thing that both holds that and turns our work into any work, right? That's a really, you know, deep idea. And so it's no wonder that it, 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 it has such that grounding effect or that it's so relevant to people because like the, 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 the psychedelic pursuit is indescribable. It's ineffable, but it's a highly personal pursuit, right? It's like, and it's entirely internal. And you can, you integrate the things you learn in that space and you make changes in your life, of course, and that impacts your environment and the people you're around and ultimately the world, but nothing is quite a lever of, you know, change in the physical world than the mechanism that we call money. And so, you know, on, with that in mind, it matters a lot what the quality and the nature of that money is, because whatever the quality and the nature of that money is, its attributes are going to influence the people that use it and the world that gets created as a result of that use. And, um, you know, so just to, to look at, a, you know, a, a huge dichotomy or disparity, what we have now predominantly in the world is a money that can be created, you know, ad infinitum by a very small group of people that get to benefit from the creation of that money. There's no, there's no genuine sacrifice in this money, in its production. Um, and that, you know, there's, and with Bitcoin, as you say, one of the reasons why it's becoming so relevant now is because in an environment where people are hearing the words like, you know, money printer and, you know, trillions of dollars and this kind of stuff that it's set against that backdrop, something with the attributes that Bitcoin has is becoming more and more appealing, even from an intuitive level. Like, because we, 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 we genuinely, uh, like if we hear of something that's infinite, like the air we breathe, let's say, that lack of scarcity causes us to, you know, we, we don't bestow value on things that are so scarce, right? We think if something is in that degree of abundance, then it's not that valuable to us. And I think that's what's happening even subconsciously for some around the world today, what's happening with how money is being treated. Um, and with Bitcoin, you know, a lot of people, the only thing they know about it is that, you know, there'll never be more than 21 million. And there's a whole lot more to it than that. But even if that's your only understanding, those two things are, you know, one, you're going to, you know, you're going to be incentivized or drawn or inspired to think that that one, just by virtue of having a limit on its supply versus an infinite supply, on the other hand, is going to be more valuable, you know, and so there's, there's so many different doors into Bitcoin. And that's what I find so fascinating about the space. You know, you could be an artist, a technologist, an investor, an economist, a fin you know, finance person, uh, you know, a philosopher, whatever. And there's a doorway into Bitcoin because money touches everything. Everyone has to use it. It's so influential in everybody's lives. And even if we don't recognize it as the op op uh, ultimate optionality, we realize that because we all chase more of it so that we can have more and do more. You know, um, and so it's a, it's a really important issue. And uh, Bitcoin has brought something to money that's never been brought to money before. You know, you can look at money also in terms of money is just the most tradable good. You know, so anything that is the most tradable good in a given society becomes money. So we've had money that was money has been salt. Money has been sh seashells. Money has been obviously gold and silver in certain environments. Money is cigarettes. And, um, you know, it, it matters how the money is produced. And in, in my opinion, and, and a lot of people in the Bitcoin space, what Bitcoin does is it allows for a fair production of money and a fair distribution of money that can't be co-opted or corrupted. You know, this is a censorship resistant element of Bitcoin. And if, if it didn't have that, it wouldn't be appealing because even something like gold, you know, which is, there's a lot of gold bugs in the world that think we should go back to a gold standard and, Gold was a good money because there was a high cost to its production. 
and the high cost to its production served as an effective limit on how much of it could be, that could be created. And again, so that brings in the element of scarcity. And of course, it had other variables and elements and attributes that allowed it to be used as money. It was divisible, it was malleable, it was you know, nigh indestructible and that kind of stuff. Um, but its physicality meant that it centralized, right? If you have a lot of gold, what do you start thinking? Well, how do I protect this? And once a lot of people think that was we'll say, well, let's all put it in one place and let's erect, you know, basically a fortress around that. And I think the story of civilization to a large degree is the story of stationary capital and how you protect stationary capital and how stationary capital incentivizes or, or impacts the logic of violence. Right. So you, so when we had you know, the again? agriculture, Can you say that the last five seconds again, 10 seconds. Yeah. So stationary capital, you could look at it this way. When, when we, the agri agricultural revolution got kicked off, let's say 10,000, 12,000 years ago, whatever it ultimately was um, for the first time, you know, on mass people had capital that they needed to preserve over time. Right. So we went from kind of hunter gatherer uh, tribes that, they didn't have a lot of surplus food. They didn't have a lot of other surplus things that were valuable. So it was kind of like, you know, uh, a very consumption heavy existence. But as we started to, the agricultural revolution got kicked off. We had surplus, whether it be surplus food, and then we had a division of labor. And then of course we had, we were able to innovate and develop more things. And this created one sedentary, you know, villages and people, but it also created capital that had that persisted into the future right so you had let's say store of grains for several months and, and things like that and then once you have stationary capital it tends to centralize so you what do you do you erect you know things that protect your stationary ca uh, capital and i think you, a lot of this you know obviously there's many things that impact the the story of civilization and how it evolved but one of them is this and so once you have something to protect or once you have something of value rather you say, well, how do I protect it? And so you erect cities and you nominate kings and you, whoever's the strongest, you kind of nominate them to protect it all. And, you know, fast forward several thousand years and gold became the best form of money because of its attributes, because it was, you know, you, it was really hard to get, because it was divisible, because it was recognizable, because uh, it was indestructible. So it became money, but it was a money that because of its physical nature, you had to, it had to be centralized to protect it. And anytime you get something centralized like that, you, it becomes more easy to co-opt and corrupt. And so what is kind of the story of history is like, well, whoever has the most power is the one that, you know, can ride into the other village or the other country or whatever. And what do they do first? They go for the gold. They take the wealth because they're, the storage of gold is the most concentrated, you know, form of wealth for an entire civilization or community or whatever. And so, um, you know, that, that's what I mean when I say the logic of violence. And one of the things that Bitcoin does and one of, one of its value propositions is that it changes the logic of violence because no longer is the most concentrated form of value in a society physically centralized in one place. There's no giant honeypot that's incentivizing people to, you know, overcome whatever defenses exist to get it. It's all dispersed everywhere and it doesn't need to erect you know, expensive, elaborate forms of both protection, a la, you know, walled cities, bank vaults, whatever, um, or governance structures to protect it, a la, you know, kings, queens, and in and, and today's governmental structures. Um, and as a result, those things can't be co-opted and they can't be used for as many nefarious or malicious purposes as they have been in the past. So, you know, I know that was a lot there, but just to say that one of the attributes of Bitcoin is that it's, it's a form of money that has all the attributes to allow it to be used as such, the way that it can be sent, the way it can be div uh, divided, its indestructibility because it's, it's decentralized nature, but also that it's not all concentrated in one place. So, the, so you know, the, the f no one can take it over and derive all the power to themselves from doing so. And that changes the structures ultimately that we get in society. So I think, you know, money has a huge impact on what structures are erected in a society to administer and protect and control it. And so if you, again, back to that point about changing the nature of the money, if you change the nature of the money, not only are you going to get different behavior in the people that use it, 
but you're going to get a different society in terms of the structures that are built up around it. Mic drop. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just open I don't know if that, window. I don't know if any of that made any sense, but no, I, to I totally did. I had to open this window. Um, it's really hot when the sun is shining in here, but, um, so, okay. So, so many points to touch on there. So it's very clear that Bitcoin de-incentivizes war, right? De-incentivizes yeah, that, violent overthrow of, of, of another colony or government or whatever, which is basically the reason that all wars have been created in the first place, would you say? Money or religion? Yeah, I mean, you know, there's killing in the name of has you know there's been a, a number of different things but usually it's money or faith or to enslave and and um siphon off the productive capacity of a given population yeah okay do you think that we could live in a world without money no i don't mm -hmm. because money facilitates voluntary exchange you know it, it, it's it's basically emblematic of the sacrifice that you made with your extremely limited time and energy to do something. And the fact that someone will exchange, will use money as a medium to exchange something with you basically says is, is, is validation that somebody else values the sacrifice that you made. And, you know, they want to trade basically the time that you spent doing something for the time that they've spent doing something. And of course, this is the specialization that occurs in, in complex economies when they emerge and money is is fundamental to facilitating the complexity and the dynamism of an economy and so i think the the fairer the sounder um, the less corruptible the money is the more trade you will get the more dynamism you will get the more specialization you will get the more innovation you will get and ultimately the more abundant and prosperous society you will and peaceful society you will get and that's why, you know, people do look back at the history of money and they think, you know, in the periods where gold was used as money versus periods where, you know, uh, paper currency, let's say, was used as money, they're generally far better in terms of what they netted, what the result was for the society that was built around them. But, you know, gold, like I said before, you know, gold had problems as well. You know, in, in Roman times, the emperors would collect up all the gold coins and say, you know, these things, these things are getting a little bit battered up. We're going to make some new ones. We're just going to melt everything down and make some new ones. But they ended up clipping off about 10% of the coin, but keeping the nominal value the same. You know, and this is where the word debasement comes from, right? They're debasing the, the type of metal that's in the coin. So it might go from 100% gold to 90% gold and 10% and some kind of base metal, or they'll clip the coin. And so the coin will be smaller, but they'll say it's the same amount. And so again, gold wasn't impervious to those sorts of corruption. And as a result, you know, you get a degradation of the economy and the society and the civilization that tr that treats their money like that or for who you know whose money is able to be treated and, and co-opted and corrupted like that and again that's that's why when you start to study the history of money it's really interesting you know i, I suggest to all of your listeners to really dig in the real rabbit hole here is money you know, Bitcoin is just kind of the thing that's sitting at the end of the rabbit hole. It's being like, yo, what's up? Like, I'm here now. But the real, like, the real journey is to understand what money is and the history of money. Because then you get to see, you know, what the effects of different forms of money throughout history were. What happens to a society? What type of behavior do you get when the society is run on salt versus rye stones versus tied knots versus gold versus paper money? Because there is a dramatic difference. And, you know, it's really interesting to learn that history. And then it becomes far more clear what the different attributes of a good money are and then where they've been re represented in the past. And again, that's why when you get to the end of that and you understand what the attributes of Bitcoin are, you go, holy shit, this is not just the next iteration of money, but this is like 100x, 1000x, you know, infinitely better than any form of money we've ever had. And we're just at the beginning of that. You know, that's what makes all this so exciting, man. It's like, once you see that and see how much better of a form of money Bitcoin is than some, anything we've, we've ever had. And then when you look back and say, you know, during the quote unquote belly pock or different areas, uh, eras where, you know, gold was used, you know, things look pretty good. You know, you, you had, the, let's say, the Renaissance in Europe, and there was this explosion of art and literature and, 
you know, music and culture. And then you say, well, what will net from the money? What kind of society and culture will be built um, on, let's say, Bitcoin rails if we're accepting that Bitcoin is 100, 1,000, 10,000 times better as a money than something like gold was? Like, I mean, that's what makes all of this so exciting. And that's why we're all so enthusiastic because not only do we see that, but we realize we're at the very, very, very beginning of that process. And, and you know, what could be more exciting th than that? You know, that's a lot of these conversations that we often have. I'm sure your experience has been similar in these hyper spiritual zones, you know, when we're all trying to find ourselves or find the truth or explore our curiosity in the places that I mentioned, like Chiang Mai and Bali and, and that kind of stuff. It's like all these conversations center around like, if ultimately, how, you know, how could this be a better world? Like, how could we have a better life and how could we exist in a better world? You know, that's, that's pretty much the punchline of all, all of this, these pursuits. And to, to, to see, be able to see kind of why it is we get the world we get. And my contention is that money is a huge part of that. And then realize that we now have something on our hands since 2009 that's going to facilitate or at least provide the opportunity for a dramatically better world, being able to see that and see, like not have it be like an amorphous or an ambiguous hope, like a, gee, I hope people's behavior changes, but be able to see that a, a tool exists to build that solution. And then real trippy that, and this is something that I've been exploring on my podcast a lot, is observing the rapid behavioral change of people when they start understanding and engaging with Bitcoin, because that's how you change the world, right? You, you know, people change, behavior change is, is, is what the world is. It's just all how we behave with each other and seeing how quickly, you know, people start to change deeply ingrained habits and how they see the world and their perspective and their worldview as a result of engaging in this thing is mind blowing. You know, just over the last two years, I've spoken with tons of people that report very, very similar changes and very, you know, similarly profound and, and, uh, and rapid changes. And like, you know, you're in the, you're in the behavior change business to some degree and how, you know, it's so, you know, it's so joyful. It's so exciting when you actually get to see someone make a change that benefits them, but then, you know, to be able to see something that's going to do that on mass without, you know, needing to hold anybody's hand and bring them along. Like it almost is something that, that has that effect just by virtue of its nature well, then you start to ask the question like, well, what the fuck is its nature that's having that effect on people? You know, and that's a, that's a juicy question deep down yeah. the rabbit hole. That, that, I like take, to get that into. takes me to what I wanted to ask you next anyway. So I'd love to get into some of the positive uh, changes that people go when they get into Bitcoin. But there is one negative that I've observed that I'd love your commentary on. So it feels like I've met a lot of Bitcoiners who are living in scarcity vibration, right? So I've, the, the way I, I learned about money from this book called Busting Loose from the Money Game, which talks about money is an energy and you can either be a magnet for the energy of money or you can be repelling it by grasping for it, you know, wanting it, you know, it's, it's, like, it's like water. You can't grab water, right? It's an energy that moves through you and whatever. This, this sort of the spiritual... Um, lessons that I've learned about money. It seems like a lot of Bitcoiners are really in a scarcity mindset because all they want to do is put as much fiat into the thing as possible to where they're actually like incessantly in a state of lack. Like I don't have enough. I don't have enough. And I've felt this myself a lot. Um, and I actually don't enjoy it. Right. Even if I were to get more Bitcoin as a result of this energy, uh, I don't actually think it's conducive to my well-being. And I'm of the opinion that what you do in one day has to be conducive to your well-being and not looking at like, okay, I'm doing this thing for the future. And then in the future, I'll be happy because I'll have so much more Bitcoin. So I'm curious about this, this and everything else I've observed has been positive, but I'm curious about, you know, what you think about this sort of uh, you know, living in, in a scarcity vibration. Because in my opinion, feeling wealthy is as amazing as being wealthy. Like I've met people who don't have that much money on paper, but they go around and they just 
they magnetize wealth. They magnetize abundance in every category of life because they, they are it, right? They just are in that space of like, I can do anything. I have anything I need. The universe takes care of me, right? So where do you think that comes from? And, and do you feel that way? And, and, uh, <clears throat> and how can we change that? <laughs> well, first of all, I do definitely feel that way. And like, you know, <laughs> in, in part, it's understandable, right? Like, and the caveat here is, I could be wrong, we could all be wrong, this thing could fail, right? Okay, so tick box, we've, we've stated the obvious, and we're going we're gonna to move forward without having to make that caveat every time. Mm -hmm. But if we're not wrong, and this actually is legit, and it's what we all think it is, it, it kind of staggers the mind to ever think of something more valuable that, you know, something tangible of greater value, right? Like, love and your relationships and your family and you know those things that are intangible and deeply meaningful of course like you know you, you can never trade those so we're not comparing it to that but in terms of anything you could desire to acquire in the you know quote unquote physical world what could be more what could have more of a pull than the thing that has the greatest form of optionality that we've ever encountered and which the more you learn about it the more you begin to see like how fundamentally important and in demand, this thing is going to be in the future, you know? So it, it, it's understandable that people are chasing it so hard, but you're right. You're absolutely right in that it does, it could very easily for a lot of people. And I, I see this and I've experienced it myself, put you in that state of, of, of uh, yeah, thinking that you don't have enough, you know, broadly, broadly speaking. And, you know, a funny anecdote here is that um, I'm sure you've seen some of the interviews with uh, Michael Saylor. Mm -hmm. all of them yeah so he he yeah yeah so for your listeners he's the ceo of of microstrategy it's a publicly listed company on the nasdaq and uh he became a bitcoiner this year in march fell down the rabbit hole extremely hard and extremely fast he's a brilliant guy and uh, i spoke to i had him on my show and we had a, a wonderful conversation but one of the 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 uh, the stories he shared so this guy's a billionaire, right? He's got, you know, five yachts, tons of homes, you know, extremely wealthy guy. And he was saying that, and so nominally, it's, it's, not, it's almost like it's not even about the nominal money to him. But when he was getting into Bitcoin, he put $200 million of his personal wealth into it. When he was buying it, he wanted to buy it pretty much all at once. And the exchange that he was working with was saying, you're, you're killing our spreads. We don't have the supply to sell you. We're going to have to sell you 35 million today and tomorrow we'll get you the other 15 million because he was buying it in a, in a 50, he sent them a 50 million uh, transfer. And he said he went to bed, bed that night with anxiety, feeling chronically short, you know, feeling like, oh my God, like I don't have enough and I might not get it. Like, just think about that for a second. A guy that has literally everything, you know, everything you could ever want somehow the pull of this thing even acts on on someone like him someone in his situation so it's incredibly powerful but i do think you're right in saying that we have to be really careful you know actually breed love rob you know one of the questions that i love that he has posed to me before and i think he shared uh, elsewhere as well um and he, and it's a quote from some philosopher or i can't remember exactly who but it says Everything, everything comes into this world with a curse, right? So even the, the absolutely greatest things, you know, psychedelics, is another good example, like for most people, it's going to fundamentally transform who they are and what their perception of reality even is. But for other people, it's going to be, it could be, you know, potentially damaging, you know, it could be potentially harmful if they're not ready, if they're not in the right mind space and that kind of stuff. And so surely Bitcoin will have a, a curse. Or at least, you know, if that, if that quote holds true, it will. What's that? A shadow side. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think, you know, this, you could make a case that this is one of them, uh, that, that people need to be careful and need to be mindful of how they're engaging it so they don't give, you know, so, you know, so they don't give way to regret of not, you know, getting in earlier as, you know, everyone in the space has felt and not, um, you know, not letting the tether out too far in terms of being too obsessive about this, you know, getting this thing. And, um, you know, one of the, the ideas that I like in the space is uh, something called, you know, Bitcoin Zen. And my, my friend Gigi, um, who's a writer in the space, he's written books and articles and just a, a phenomenal guy. 
you know, he talks about it a lot. And, um, and this is kind of, you know, to bring it very meat and potatoes, practical speak. This is why in 2020, dollar cost averaging approach to accumulating Bitcoin has become a dominant part of the narrative. Like when I came in, people were talking about trading, people talking about time in the market, when to get in, when to get out, all this kind of stuff. But now most people that are drawn into it now, they understand you hold it forever, you never sell it, you, and you, you DCA. So you, you squirrel away a certain amount every week, every month, whatever of, your, of your, um, the income that you can spare. And you don't obsess about time in the market. You don't trade. And those are, those are actually things in response to what you're describing. You know, people have put this in place so it doesn't consume you. So it doesn't, you know, kind of uh, inhibit you from both being happy and living a, you know, a vibrant life and engaging in other areas and being productive in, a, in other areas. So I think that's one of the practical ways that it's been done. But I think on a more philosophical level, some people are starting to come to, you know, you, you, a realization that, yes, you could go balls to the wall and just try to accumulate as much as possible. But what kind of life is that? Versus knowing that you're slowly accumulating, you know, the best form of money that's ever existed. And it's probably going to mean that your future is fundamentally secure, but, you know, don't let that uh, overwhelm you or overtake, you know, your sense of peace, basically, you know, so I've called uh, Bitcoin in the past, uh, a heartbeat of existential comfort, right? So it can be that if you allow it to be, but, you know, if you get overly consumed with, greed effectively then you know you 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 may uh, the curse or the shadow may be taking more from you than you stand to gain especially if god forbid something happens in the future where you make a mistake you fuck up you you lose your coin then you've just spent a lot of years living a, a, a you know to use your terminology a life kind of in the shadow and now you have nothing to show for it i mean it's a it's it's a fine line you know and and this this space has that's part of the reason why it inspires such a sense of, of personal responsibility and kind of like radical personal responsibility because the, the other edge of the sword of, of total freedom and sovereignty is that everything is on you. You know, you can't call up your bank and be like, somebody stole my visa or where's my FDIC insurance. You lose it. It's gone forever and you're not getting it back. And so, you know, people, and, but that's part of the beautiful thing too, because people, recognize that and they, they recognize that they need to become a better version of their, themselves to hold something with those qualities you know to to know that this thing that you hold is totally your responsibility and the promise of freedom and sovereignty that it holds for your future is so appealing that it causes you to transform yourself to be able to manage that responsibility properly beautifully said there's something that we're missing here, I know, for my audience in that this is all music to my ears and this is exactly the vibration that I'm living in when I, when I think about Bitcoin. But most people are like, it's a stock and I'm going to invest in it and I wanna, it's gonna, I'm going to re get this return. And, and they could never fathom that Bitcoin could take over this level of uh, psychological um, sort of resting point, right? That, that they could never understand what, why we're talking in this way. Can you, in a basic way, explain how and why Bitcoin is not just an investment? It's not just the stock that you put money into and hope that you're going to gain a return. Can you sort of explain why this thing is so magical? <laughs> I don't know. Um, you know, I, I think uh, one of the things I touched on earlier and, you know, again, to uh, reference Rob, he, he's really great at articulating this kind of stuff. But it, you know, money is meant to be emblematic of the sacrifices you make um, to ensure that your future is better than your present effectively. And it's the way that you hold that sacrifice and trade it and store it for the future. So, you know, store it across time, store, you know, is storing it for the future and, store, and, and uh, storing it across space is, is trading it with somebody else. But think about that. I mean, you know, Michael Saylor actually, um, you know, he's talked about, you know, it, it kind of money kind of being your life force, an extension of your life force, let's say, because it's the thing you get in return for expending your life force, right? And uh, you want to make sure, or, you know, of course, there's going to be a preference. If, 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 
let's put frame it in those terms. Money is what you get for the expenditure of your life force. If you get something in return that leaks your life force, right? So let's say a, a, a paper currency that someone, you know, a thousand miles away can debase 5% a year, 10% a year, you know, in, in, in many countries as this year, the money supply has gone up multiples, but even in the most developed markets, I mean, 25% of the U S dollars in circulation today were created this year. And that means that, you know, they were debased by that degree. And so do you want to operate with a, a money that's going to preserve and in, in certain cases in, you know, in pay homage to, the sacrifice of your life force throughout time or one that's going to completely leak it ultimately to the point of depletion so that, you know, the sacrifice that you made when you made it uh, is made less and less valuable over time. You're less and less able to redeem that sacrifice in the future for what it meant when you made it. And so, you know, what could be more fundamental, spiritual, um, you know, than that? Because that's what, you know, that is the, the essence of what we are, you know, we're, we're, that's the essence of being alive. And, um, you know, so having that a, a thing that can preserve, uh, you know, and I know this is very heady talk, but I think your audience will appreciate it's, it. But, so, you know, some, yeah, take it, go yeah, as esoteric yeah. as you want. Yeah. Don't well, hold you know, having something, having something that can preserve your life force, the better something can preserve your life force so that you can transact with it in the future, whether with yourself or with somebody else, people are gonna be drawn towards. Because inherently, even subconsciously, they know what that sacrifice is. They know the opportunity cost of doing one thing versus another. And they, people naturally wanna be rewarded the most that they can and have the most optionality for the future. You know, to bring back that term, it's like if, if the money you use continually gets debased and devalued, then it's, narrowing and narrowing and diminishing and diminishing your optionality. And people may not be familiar with that word, but it just means what you can do, what level of freedom you have with the resources under your domain. So in, you know, with certain forms of money, which we have today, it gets less and less and less and less, less, you know, uh, less optionality, less freedom, less things that potential that you can do and extract over time versus the money that holds that, that sacrifice of your life force perfectly throughout time. So you can be sure a thousand years from now, well, you know, that's, that's, we that's too far in the future. To, we don't know what's going to happen a thousand years, but let's say 50 years, let's say a hundred years, even that would be a huge improvement over what we have today. And to know that it'll pre be preserved, you know, in exactly the optionality that you sequestered it in it today, if not more, over that period of time is amazing, you know, and, and that allows for, or that inspires a different perspective towards money. And I think it, it, it fosters a, a very different culture and civilization. And, and again, I think the coalescing Bitcoin community are exemplars of what that change is and are kind of at the vanguard or the tip of the spear of revealing what some of those changes in how people approach money, how people approach themselves, how people approach their ethics and their principles and their morals, how they approach their, their relationships. They're the ones that are kind of as, as unlikely as it seems, because they seem like a bunch of rebel jackasses on Twitter, right? Just always yelling at each other and shitting on anyone who doesn't love Bitcoin. But, you know, if you dig a little deeper, you know, especially to the extent that I've had the good fortune to do, you, be, you begin to see all this pretty clearly. And it's, it's wild to think that they are the, the first ones that are revealing what happens when you choose to, let's say, you know, store your life force in a different way, in a way that's going to preserve it far further into the future than anything we have access to today. And, you know, speaking of my friend Gigi, he asked me to ask Sailor, you know, kind of a funny question. Uh, but he said, you know, ask Mike, when he got to the end of the rabbit hole, what did he see? Or at its current depth, you know, where, where he's at. And Mike said, immortality. And, uh, you know, and then he clarified, said, like, if not your physical immortality, immortality of your will and your values and your, your ethics and your morals. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll leave it to your audience to chew on that one for themselves because we all kind of have to 
that's one that you got to spend some quiet time with. And, and, you know, based off some of the words that I've said so far, and I'm sure lots of more ideas that they may have and insights they may have, that will become a little bit more apparent, but it's, it's a fun one to grapple with. And I, I largely, I think I see what he means when he says that. It's almost like the hour of work you spend today, your great, great, great grandson is going to be able to have more freedom because of the hour of work that you spend today. Mm -hmm. But what if we don't have yeah, kids? And preserve. <laughs> What's that? What if we don't have want or have kids? Then, then our wealth is just for us or to give it to the world, I guess. Because if well, you die I mean, with in, in one way or the other, you're going to give it to the world. So <laughs> yeah. in, in one way, if, if they don't, if that optionality isn't given to your kids, then uh, you'll probably find other means of distributing it before you go. And if you don't, and it dies with you, then all the value that you held gets dispersed to everybody else who's holding that money. Like that's kind of the trip too, right? Like if, if you don't, if you don't intentionally do something to, you know, to, to use that uh, optionality, that wealth to do whatever your will uh, desires of it or your progeny's will, then the, the optionality of the will embedded in that money gets shared amongst everybody else who holds it and it becomes part of their will. Because it can never move from that address? Exactly, yeah. Because so it's, it's permanently it's the supply is down in that in that. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it, it's the opposite of inflation, right? More money supply means all the existing money gets devalued. But in, in Bitcoin, you know, coins that are lost will mean there are less coins to represent the same amount of economic wealth and prosperity. And that means if coins are lost, then the coins in existence have to go up in, in basically value to represent all of the economic activity that they're uh, pricing. Mm. So you're, 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 you're gifting, you're making a gift to the world one way or another, it seems. Oh. It's fascinating. <laughs> how, how exactly does Bitcoin um, prevent some sort of overtaking or corruption? Like how, how, how does the math or the computer, the, the, the computer programming, how is it designed so that it can't be corruptible in basic terms? Yeah, in, in basic terms, I mean, it's, it's open source software and people that choose, choose to engage with the network and, you know, hardcore Bitcoiners will tell you that you should uh, run and use a node. And a node is just basically a version of the software that allows, you know, allows you to dictate what your you know, version of the software you're running. So what Bitcoin means to you is it, you express that effectively by running this node and that will have certain rules that, you know, mean that only things, only something with those rules is what you're going to call Bitcoin. And then it allows you to verify that when you do so, you know, that is actually what you're engaging with. Like the, the, the Bitcoin that is in accord with the rules that, that you agree to adhere to, and the node allows each individual to confirm that for themselves. So, you know, there's been hard forks where people say, ah, I think Bitcoin should be different and I'm going to change this little attribute of it. And they go off and do that. Mm -hmm. And people can choose to go with that new network or stay with the Bitcoin network. And that's been done a lot of times. Um, or, you know, you could say you have a malicious someone managing the code base or, you know, administrator of, of you know, the developers and stuff like that. You could say there's a, a malicious one there, but first of all, there's a hefty review process that goes on and it's, it's all open, you know, open source. So it's unlikely that something would squeak through unnoticed and would be merged in, into the network. Um, but let's say it could happen. You would still have the choice to reject that change and say, no, that's not, that's not Bitcoin to me. Therefore I reject that. And, you know, I'm going to keep running, you know, the Bitcoin, what, what I believe to be Bitcoin. And, and then, you know, everyone does that, right? And people do it on different networks and the market decides. The market says, what is the money here? And, and it's my belief that um, we only get one crack at this. You know, Bitcoin was able to kind of emerge from the shadows before anybody realized what it really was. And it was able to be distributed and it wasn't squashed early when it could have easily been. And now it's, it's so distributed and it's so decentralized and there's so much uh, energy and power devoted to this, this network and there's so much economic mass to it. You know, a lot of people will say that one of the threat models is that, you know, obviously 
having a, a free market form of money is a big threat to nation states and governments all over the world. And people say like, wouldn't the U S government, the Chinese government, whoever try to shut it down. And, you know, I, theoretically it's, it's definitely possible. Um, but is it probable that they'll, you know, spin up that amount, you know, they'll get all the hardware, they'll devote all the power to the network um, and they'll, you know, try to stifle it in some way or clog it up or censor transactions um, it's possible, but economically it's, it's a big move. And I think, you know, the network would find ways around it anyways. And on that point, let's say they're successful. I mean, the real thing that can't be replicated, well, there's a couple of things, but one is definitely what's called the UTXO set. It's the set of all transactions that have ever happened on Bitcoin. And everyone who runs a node has that full ledger of transactions. So let's say there's, you know, 10,000 plus full nodes around the world, they all hold a full uh, historical ledger. Mm -hmm. So even if something happened to the network, that's what's important because that's, that is the organic distribution of this organism onto the world the first time. And if we lost that, then we'd be starting from square one. And I don't think we could achieve a fair distribution again because people know what it is now and people would game it and corrupt it and all sorts of ways. Um, but we'd be able to, I think, bootstrap it from that history. Um, yeah. So, you know, I think uh, there is definitely, it's definitely responsible to consider the threat models. And, you know, a lot of discussion happens in the space about what those threat models are and how to mitigate them and how to, you know, preemptively f push back or fight back against them. And it's a very adversarially minded, you know, um, community. Uh, and perhaps, you know, maybe it turns out to be far more than we need it to be. I mean, it certainly seems like there's a lot of tailwinds right now. I mean, you know, mainstream is coming on to Bitcoin, mainstream finance, ma mainstream, you know, people, politicians even are saying, you know, they're starting to see it and they're saying, yeah, this, this looks like a force for good in the world. Let's do it. And we just always assume that the, the entrenched powers that be that control, you know, global money, let's say, eventually they're going to be like, you know, we can't let this happen. And that's when the real game will be on between Bitcoiners and those powers that be. Um, so I, I do think it's good to be mindful of those threats and, you know, employ all the best practices you can to be in the best position to mitigate uh, those threats on an individual level and contribute to a solution on a network level. But, um, you know, at, at the moment, it's, uh, I, I don't think it's probable that this network ever gets to be stopped. And I think that's really good because like I said, I think it's, um, I, I think it's a, a one and done sort of thing. Um, and I think that's the thing that a lot of people miss when they say, when they go about optimizing it is that certain things about this can't, should never be changed. And it's the fact that we're never going to change them. That is, that makes it so special, right? If you just decide now that, well, let's have some inflation for whatever half-baked reason about economic growth or whatever, well then, okay, we start with 2%, but a hundred years from now, we're like, oh, we need 10% inflation. Oh, we need 60%. Well, then it no longer, for that particular case, it no longer preserves your sacrifice, your life force, or just to use normal terms, value the way it once did. And the, the act of changing it makes it corruptible, right? A lot of people refer to Bitcoin as this alchemical term of the incorruptible substance, right? Something that the human beings, you know, are... We've created this thing that is not subject to our malice and our own, you know, our own corruption. And if we fail to realize how special that is and we implement changes to fundamental attributes to it, well, then we open up the floodgates to all manner of changes, whether they be benevolent or malicious in the future. So I'm, I'm a hardcore don't change certain attributes of Bitcoin um, and any changes you do make, make them backwards compatible so that anyone who wants to reject new things that, because Bitcoin is, you know, one of the things that make it so mind blowing and all this enthusiasm I've been sharing with you is that it's not only the best form of money we've ever had as it currently stands, but it's programmable money. Like we're going to be able to make it do things that we have never even conceived of yet. And that's really exciting. And I'm, I'm all for that if we don't change some fundamental attributes. One very easy example is the hard cap. You know, the, you know, there's a lot of development happening on Bitcoin and that's great. You never, ever, ever 
change 21 million. That is Bitcoin's hard cap forever, and it is fundamental to what Bitcoin is and the value that it represents. And not just like the economic value, but what it means for humanity. And so we have to uphold that and resist anybody who would seek to, to change that. Is there a debate in that category or is that not even? Not discussion? really. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it pops up every now and then. I, I mean, I, I think I speak for a lot of hardcore Bitcoiners um, and people that have been around the, the scene for a long time when I say, it's, there's a lot of consensus, like, no, this should never be touched. But, you know, there's people, there are people, and even in the development community, because, you know, developers that contribute to Bitcoin Core, the software, that, that are open to that discussion. And so when I see that, I usually chime in and, and say, you know, no, <laughs> you know, let's have the discussion, of course. Like, that's what I love about, you know, people think the Bitcoin community and Bitcoin Twitter is toxic. I mentioned that a few minutes ago. Um, but it's, I don't see it that way at all. And if you see it that way, you're not dedicated enough to the truth. You're more dedicated to pr the preservation of your, your fragile ego, Feeling in my good. opinion. Yeah. You want to be right. Yeah, you want to be right. You want to feel good. You want to whatever. This is a battleground. And it's the, it's the battleground of the most significance, you know, w one of the most significant battlegrounds I can think of. Um, and and the, the, you know, the implications are so great that we don't have time to pussyfoot around and make sure everybody feels good. You come in with your ideas. And if you're bold enough and you think they're good to put them in the ring, great, all, like all for it. But be ready to get your ass kicked or to get them to get a few cuts and scrapes or to even have it accepted and say, yeah, that's a really good idea. Let's carry it further, only to have it be refined or changed or totally thrown out, you know, in, in due course, you know. So people, some people come in and say that's toxic. And I, I just think it's, it's, a, it's a group of people that are ruthlessly dedicated to the refinement of the truth. And that to me is far more important than my own ego and what I want people to think about me. And, and, you know, I call it out when I see it in the space too, when, you know, people cry toxicity or they say that their feelings hurt are hurt when really all that's happening is a, a bunch of people are saying, no, we're not, we're not dealing in that kind of bullshit. We got way bigger issues at hand and we want to, it, not only the ruthless dedication to the re refinement of truth, but the, that process as fast as possible, right? So there's no time to patty cake things and, and make people feel good just for the sake of it. Come in. And you know what the crazy thing is, man, is like once you realize that and you approach this phenomenon with that attitude where it ain't about you, but it's about the ideas and getting to the, the core of the best ones as soon as possible, um, and the, the greatest one, the grandest one, perhaps being truth, however we choose to define that. Once you do that, what I found is that even the most, you know, you know, toxic, what a lot of people would say, like troll like people that they see on Twitter. Big, for me, the Bitcoin community is fucking all love, man. It's butter. You know, you just got to you. They just smell bullshit. We all do. And it, but if you show up as your genuine self with your ego at the door, dedicated to the truth of the idea, it's amazing what this community uh, is. And I like, I talk about Bitcoiners a lot because the technology and the economic uh, merit of Bitcoin is, is, is definitely foundational to that, but it's nothing but a tool for the prohibition or the permission, you know, the permission of certain behaviors, cer certain novel behaviors. Like if this thing doesn't inspire or generate or permit novel behaviors in terms of how we interact with ourselves and how we interact with one another, then what's the, pur what's the purpose of it? What's special about it? Nothing. It's only special in so far as it, it, it changes what behavior behaviors are possible. Right. And so what I'm super excited about is seeing the development of that culture, of those new behaviors, of those new methods of interaction and just, you know, um, being awestruck and, and, you know, endlessly fascinated by that process that's unfolding and by all the, the phenomenal people that I have the, the great fortune of interacting with uh, and being a part of simultaneously. So, you know, as we often say, um, 
bullish on Bitcoiners, you know, just it's, it's a phenomenal group of people. And, you know, obviously now you're among them. It's, it's sucking people in from, sucking from in. all parts and it's amazing. Magnetic. Yeah. I've lost a lot of interest in other things since getting it. <laughs> Tell me about it. <laughs> yeah. Well, John, I don't know. How are you on time? Do you want to go into anything else or should we call it here? What are you I'm, feeling? I'm good as long as you want to go, man. Okay. Let me just take a breath and, and see where I want to take this. I don't really pre-rehearse or write down questions beforehand. So Me neither, man. <laughs> yeah. Me neither. Do your thing. Yeah. So what are, what are some of the positive, you know, psychological changes that we could talk about that Bitcoin has brought to you or people that you know? Like I know Michael Saylor, who I think is freaking genius, um, love listening to that guy. He, you know, his whole complexion changed, his skin changed. He started taking care of his health, his well-being. It seems that, you know, when, when you have this, technology that preserves your life force, it seems like you end up doing that in every arena of life, right? You end up sort of leaking less in every arena of life is what is what I've observed. Um, I even my friend Alex, who showed me your work, uh, and got me into Bitcoin um, has, you know, changed his health and changed his diet and started really taking care of him, his body since getting into uh, into Bitcoin, where, whereas he was never into that sort of thing, right? So what have you kind of observed uh, around people and in your own journey? Man, that's a big one. Yeah. Um, you know, on a surface level, like, you know, to, to get the answer to this question kicked off is, you know, the basics of, I've come across a lot of people that uh, let's say we're spending time with a lot of, you know, people that, they weren't very aligned with or, you know, toxic people or whatever. They, they, they change that up and they change how they engage in relationships, how they were treating their body is obviously a big one. You know, they just weren't considering their health before not, you know, not having a healthy approach to their physical health. And that changes, um, you know, the, the, the type of work they choose to do changes their motivation for work in general you know, changes, you know, a lot of people in the Bitcoin space, like once they get in what, two things, one, they really want to work in Bitcoin and get out of whatever they're, they're working in. But two, so many people voluntarily contribute their time to this ecosystem, you know, and I'm, I'm one of them. Um, but, you know, people that are core devs, people working on certain projects, you know, I direct the attention of your audience to BTC pay server, which is, you know, really cool, uh, you know, basically payment processing merchant platform that's, kind of like WordPress for Bitcoin, allowing everybody to be their own payment processor. Like that whole team was doing, you know, everything voluntarily from the beginning. Like there's such a strong ethos of, of um, like there's such a strong reason or there's such a strong why behind a lot of people that enter this space that they, you know, they're willing to contribute uh, without being compensated. And, you know, that's against your own financial interests. And, you can only do it for so long. And the beautiful thing is, is that a lot of people that take that leap, they end up, you know, it ends up sorting itself out, you know, because if you, you, you know, as we all know, if you do something that you really want to do, that you're really excited by, that you're enthusiastic by, that you're set on fire by, who you are when you're brought to that pursuit is vastly different than who you are when you're sitting at that office job from nine to five, punching and shit in the computer that you don't give a single fuck about, right? It's just night and day who, who you, who the person that shows up there. And so when you find that degree of alignment with something that you're so, that you find so meaningful, what happens is like the stuff that you end up putting, the, the result of your work is special and people recognize it. And, you know, there's probably going to be demand for it or you in some capacity. And so um, those are some of the things that I see uh, on a personal, you know, uh, the, the, the types of changes that I see uh, happening with people. And uh, it, it's, it's remarkable. The big question for me, like I think we touched on a little while back is, you know, why? Like, and I think there's a lot of answers to that question. Surely what, you know, I think the next big wave of people, I mean, number go up is a very compelling thing because, you know, having more optionality to do 
you know, to extract potential from your life is appealing to people. So, you know, number go up, you're wealthier. People want that. But I think it's becoming apparent how attractive the, the culture and the community of this whole thing is that it, set against the backdrop of a world that in many cases is in chaos or falling apart, or at, at the very least, you know, being extremely generous with my language uh, is experiencing some turbulence right now. Set against that backdrop, you know, a, a community of people that are positive, engaging, intellectually on fire, committed, you know, principled, ethical, um, hopeful for the future, optimistic, like that is extremely appealing. And so I think a lot of people are coming in because of that now because say, man, that's a positive fucking community. And then they might say, okay, let me learn more about this Bitcoin thing. You know, and another aspect of all this, I think is people realize now what's on the table. I think I, I said this in the sailor interview, but you know, before we, a lot of us probably looked out on the future and, and said, and you know, the, you know, this, I mean, diseases of despair are, 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 that's the real epidemic these days. And, uh, and you know, people look out on their future and they say, what's there for me? Like, I don't want to be at this shitty office job for the next 40 years of my life. I don't want to, you know, be under the thumb of XYZ government or, you know, industrial complex of whatever kind for the rest of my life. Like, how, how does this get turned around? I don't see light at the end of this tunnel. And when you start to understand Bitcoin and you start to realize the type of culture and society and civilization that's very likely to be uh, emerge on as a result of that on top of that foundation then you know kind of parts things and you do see that light you know and you see holy shit like this this could actually be a lot better and i can now see uh, you know i can see i can envision a future in that world you know i can see happiness for myself in that world and you know that in you know that hope inspires people to say okay well before i didn't see shit on the horizon so what's the point of refining myself more to to try to get it i don't even want what that offers but you flip it around and you say you know it could be that on the horizon that degree of hope then the spotlight comes back on the individual and they say how do i optimize myself maximally to take advantage of that future that i i now see how do i refine myself so that i'm most able to extract potential from the future that i now envision as a result of having a changed perspective in this way so, you know, that's a motivating factor for people saying, holy fuck, like, how do I, I got to whip myself into shape? How should I do that? And, uh, and, you know, I think there's an element of confronting this thing, this seemingly incorruptible thing, this verifiable form of truth, this constant in, in society to rally around. And we look at the different attributes of it, of its openness, of its transparency, of its, you know, of its incorruptible truth. And naturally, everything in our environment at some point, conscious and sub subconscious, we look at and we compare it in relation to our perception of ourselves. You know, this isn't obvious all the time. Certainly, in some cases, it's more obvious than others. But we have this entity now with certain attributes. And when, the more apparent they become, the disparity or the contrast between it and us, be, you know, becomes more apparent as well, becomes more obvious. And to the extent that, you know, you don't reflect some of those characteristics that you see in Bitcoin that you, you, know, you, you highly prize and you think are incredibly valuable, I think it causes you to reflect on yourself and say those kind of core things like truth and honesty and integrity and principles, um, you know, maybe I need to spend more time refining those elements within me because, you know, I'm not really comfortable with the contrast I'm noticing between that entity and this entity, that, which is me. And so I think that is another motivating uh, factor for, for why people uh, ch seem to change so fundamentally and so rapidly as they enter this space. You know, and that's only two or three or four, man. I think, I think this is way more complex than, than we can even really, from, from within, I, I think it's really hard to see it. You know, the hindsight of history will help a lot in terms of understanding what process is, is going on or was going on. But, you know, this is, uh, we're being swept along with this thing more than just as much as we're pushing it forward, let's say. And um, it, it's, it's, it's hard to identify all the different winds that are blowing to, you know, whip up this tornado. We can just say, you know, 
it looks like that's a factor and that's a factor and that's a factor. But as, as is often said, you know, the rabbit hole seems endless and I'm sure there's a lot more juicy details down there that speak to, you know, the core of who we are, what consciousness is, you know, what reality is, all that crazy stuff that seems super far out. I think we'll find that uh, there's some sort of strange relation there. Yeah. Yeah. And during that, through this tornado, we have to keep our center. I, I find myself a lot of, you know, the lessons I've learned from ayahuasca and Vipassana and my years of meditation and years of spiritual work are that, you know, the, the, the essence of life is being as present as possible in every single moment like that. If I could do that, all of my problems go away. Right. I make more money. Yeah. I'm a better boyfriend. I'm a better son. I'm a better, I'm better in every category of life. I'm, I have creative life force flowing through me 24 seven when I'm just super present. Right. And yeah. I guess I'm curious as to how we can practice presence in this game of Bitcoin. Cause it, radically pulls me off my center pretty much on a daily basis just by looking at the price or just like counting how many I have. Right. And it's like, how do we, that's more in line with the Bitcoin Zen thing that you were talking about, which I feel like I would love to bring that into the space. If I dive into this Bitcoin space ever, like as a figure, I'm more in the health, I'm, in, I'm a health figure right now. Um, but it feels like, you know, bringing that, like ultimately in life, it's just this money, this tool that we can use and it gives us all this opportunity, but it feels like the most important thing is still that presence. You know, it's still that oh. like this, this, who you are in between the six inches of your ears, who you are in your heart and your body, the conversations you're having with yourself. No one can, no one thing can change that. Like Bitcoin can't change that for forever. It can change it for a year. It can change it for five years. Eventually you, when you have $50 million, it's all the same. Right. And you, and then something's going to flip and you're going to go negative And it's like, you're going to have to learn how to do the real work at some point in time. We all have to like face our demons, right. And face our shit. So I'm just curious about your relationship or you don't, not even really a question here, more just, just a statement um, as far as ha like me observing when something is so exciting uh, and so powerful, the most important thing is actually creating space from it you know? I know <laughs> and like you being in my center, you know? Yeah. I, I, I feel like I know exactly what you mean. And, and first I'll say there's no substitute for the inner work and the inner peace to be derived from that work. You know, as you say, I mean, that may be the quintessence, you know, that may be the ultimate, you know, that sense of, of peace. And it would make sense that it is because it's purely internal. And if we're, if, if sovereignty and freedom is the thing that we're after here, then it can't be conditional on anything external to ourselves. That is all, you know, that's all gravy. It facilitates the greater expression of who we are as individuals, but your ultimate freedom is entirely internally determined. And that's something that people need to, I think, realize. And I say that not from the point of view of having uh, actualized that in every moment of my life or in every aspect of my life, but it is aspirational. I know, I know the value and the worth and the, the truth of that. I'm very certain about that. And, you know, I, I gain uh, greater insight into that through the many different practices and, and psychedelic uh, journeys being one of them. So, you know, I, I, I don't think it's a, a substitute in, in, in by any means, but it is interesting, you know, of course, like, like you were saying, this big, you know, burning ball of curiosity external to you disrupts your peacefulness, right? Because it, 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 it animates you and it, it ignites you. And I find that, you know, when I'm having these conversations and when I'm reading about Bitcoin and having these kind of mind blowing realizations, like, I'm stirred up. I'm not peaceful whatsoever. I'm like, do it before bed. I think <laughs> was that? Yeah, exactly. You know, and I'll bed. get off this, I'll get off this call and I'll be, I'll be too amped up to sleep for a couple hours, you know, because that's, that's, you know, I don't filter anything about like, I don't care at all how I'm perceived or anything like my fundamental approach to things is I don't think I'm a piece of shit person like I like I at least I can say that so with that you know with, with that in place 
I'm happy to just express whatever the person I am right now and let the chips fall where they may and see what happens. And I'll obviously continue to try to refine that through all the different means and methods that I use to do so. Um, but, you know, I totally feel you. I get amped up, you know, in these conversations all the time. But I think what's interesting is I get that aspect of it, but back to the Bitcoin Zen, what I'm, what I'm starting to appreciate and realize more is the kind of, when you look at it in terms of this thing that allows you to preserve your life force, your will, your value, your sacrifice, your energy, whatever way we want to characterize it, knowing that it's you, you, that the fact that you can have so much greater confidence that it's going to do that better than anything else that you currently have in your life, whether it be paper money, shares of Apple, your refrigerator, whatever, that this is going to be the most effective thing. The, the, the more you engage it, understand it, and leverage that tool in your life, I feel like that brings a, a sense of peace because it, it almost allows me to see into the future more. You know, it's, it's, and, you know, a lot of people will, will say that, you know, understanding Bitcoin kind of feels like you're hacking reality a little bit, if for no other reason, and I'm sure there are many other reasons, but one of them being, you know, you, you, you kind of have a high degree of certainty that something about the future is going to be as you think it's going to be. And that is the Bitcoin network will continue to do its thing as it always has done, you know, and, you know, you, there's not many things of human form like that, that humans have made that we can say that about. And, you know, another little side rabbit hole is maybe that was one of the, 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 the reasons and the, the motivations behind creating megalithic structures back in our prehistory, like pyramids and like Stonehenge and things like that in that, yes, I know they had, you know, astrological significance and, and use for other purposes, but maybe these big gigantic, proofs of work and it's interesting that in bitcoin that's what the 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 you know the mining mechanism is called is is a proof of work but what are the pyramids or stonehenge or you know gigantic cathedrals elaborate cathedrals anything but proof of work to say one look what we've look what our collective will can can do look what our collective will if we cooperate can produce and two that thing's going to be there for a long fucking time you know, so that's a piece of certainty that we can latch on to in an extremely uncertain world. Mm -hmm. There's so few things that you can. And, and, and so to that extent, you know, certainty seems to be a type of constant that gives you a sense of peace about the world. In like this whirling cake. Like our breath. That, yeah. Ayahuasca yeah. ceremonies, the breath is that anchor, right? That's like exactly. that's all you got. Maybe it's the breath of cyber space. You know? Exactly. Or a heartbeat or whatever. But, but that's actually a good point is like in a, in an ayahuasca experience. I mean, fuck it's, it's in certain instances, it can be extremely chaotic, right? I mean, there's a lot going on, but just to know that you have something that's constant that can bring you back to center and that can give you a sense of peace, despite the chaos of the given situation. I think that that works on every, uh, every level. And so to the, you know, Bitcoin is this, this intellectual fireball that's setting people on fire, but simultaneously, it's, it's a constant that's allowing them to have greater peace of mind about the future. And because of what it is, because it's money, because it's a way to preserve their savings um, across time, it's giving them a sense of peace about, you know, the external circumstances of their life, what's that, what that's going to be in the future. So there's far less doubt about like, oh my God, 10 years from now, like, I could be dead. And if, and if I don't do all these different things now, then, you know, you have to manage so much more. But if you can have faith, like, no, this thing is going to mean that I can extract from reality what I need to extract from it when I need it. What could, what could bestow a greater sense of peace than that? You know? And so, and then finally, the fact that it does allow you to come off the hamster wheel a bit because you're not, you know, your boat is not constantly leaking, right? It's, it's, it's so, it's a, you know, it, it's so much better at containing the value that you do create and the savings that you do want to save that, you know, all those things that clutter up our mind on a regular basis, the stresses about work and job and rent and mortgage and car payment and whatever else, they start to get quieter and quieter and quieter and quieter because the tool that you're using to, uh, to, to facilitate and manifest all those things is getting 
you know, stronger and stronger and better and better. And it's a, it's just a far better tool to tackle the manifestation of the things that you want to exist in your reality. And so, and, and into the future as well. So, you know, I think that's an incomplete answer, but I think those are a couple of points of why, yes, it can draw you away from a sense of, of peace because it's so exciting. But I think those are, 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 that's the Bitcoin Zen that's developing is that recognizing those things is allowing people to bring it back to a sense of calm and calm the mind around all this stuff. And I think it amplifies the existing uh, practices and philosophies that we have from, you know, the Eastern traditions or, or where, wherever else, you know. And that's why it's really interesting to consider, you know, how Bitcoin will be integrated into the existing schools of thought and philosophy and practices and all the rest of it. As absurd as that, I'm sure that sounds to certain people, uh, I think that will probably be the we'll case. Merge. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. It's going to merge. There's going to be schools, you know, Bitcoin schools and universities and whatever. Well, you know, the funny, the, the big question that it arises and some Bitcoiners are really against this and some are, it's self-evident to them, but it's, you know, is Bitcoin a religion? <laughs> you know, has this, has, is, has this thing become so fundamental, the, you know, what it is and the meaning that we derive from it and how we can use it and how it orders our, our, our perspective and our priorities, all of that kind of stuff. I mean, it, it starts to sound a lot like at least what religions have been used for in the past. And it's an ongoing discussion that I, you know, I, I always love to dive into about, you know, is it yes or no? Well, first we have to define what is a religion? What, what is the purpose it's used for? You know, what's the real purpose versus the, perhaps the ways in which it's been co-opted over the years. And then, then we dig down and say, well, what does it really mean? Like maybe it's just a, a, a coordinating truth that allows people, that helps people orient their life for a more beneficial outcome versus a less beneficial outcome. And if that's the case, then sure, call it a religion if you want. Or you could just articulate it that way, or, you know, it's a, it's a fun discussion. Yeah. Beautiful, man. Woo. <laughs> well, I, I think we should maybe do another one, you know, cause, cause we're going to overwhelm people. <laughs> Keep going further. Um, do you have any, any last words of wisdom or things you want to share? Hmm. I mean, I usually just say the same thing, to be honest. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a person who's in a position to give advice. You know, I, I it's just my, my two cents, but, um, I, one of the things I love about this is that it's in, both inspiring and permitting people the opportunity to show up as they are as imperfect as that may be and express themselves genuinely. And for me, that's the big thing is, you know, everyone's on different paths at different stages of that path. And you can tell when people are being false and fake and fronting and all the rest of it. And, you know, just I, I, what I want to see is people express themselves because I want to hear other people's ideas. I want to see the, the externalized contents of other people's minds, whether it be art or music or written word or, or whatever. Um, but I don't want to see it in any other form than the true genuine expression of, of, of what it is in there. And, uh, you know, so I always just say like, I'm just a dude who thought this shit was interesting and started talking about it. And, you know, as are you and as are all other podcasters and everyone who creates any sort of thing. And so I just think, you know, get busy expressing it, expressing yourself, um, but make sure that you, you know, you do it in a genuine manner. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're authentic with it. And I think what will happen is good. I think good things will happen as a result of that. I think good people will, will form around you and good relationships and opportunities will emerge and, you know, yeah, good, good things will probably continue to happen if that's the approach. So that's the approach I take. There's a huge element of faith in that, of course, because it's a less ordered and controlled approach than perhaps many of us are used to, or we were taught to do. Uh, but uh, the more I do it, the more I validate, or if, the more I do it, the more that approach is validated in my mind. Beautiful. You put your art into the world in any capacity, whether it's the language or music, any capacity. And, you know, and it's, if it's authentic, you're going to manifest a beautiful life for yourself. That's, that's, I've always shared the same belief. And that's how I started this business, you know, just basically just sharing my, 
my mind authentically and somehow people want to listen to it <laughs> you know? yeah yeah it's a trip <laughs> yeah. yeah cool john so uh and and we'll, sorry matt oh, right, also ahead. i just wanted to uh, yeah i just wanted to say thank you for for you know having me on and, and for the discussion it's been great to share some of my thoughts with you and hear some of yours and you know i really appreciate it yeah awesome man Go check out his Twitter, uh, John Vallis. I'll post links to his Twitter, to his podcast. You've got to listen to his episode with Michael Saylor. It's one of the most entertaining, mind-blowing episodes of any uh, category that I've ever listened to, not, not only if you're into Bitcoin. Um, <clears throat> and um, uh, what, where else? Twitter and Bitcoin Rapid Fire is the name of your podcast. Anywhere else that you're big? No, nope, that's, you know, those two places, you'll probably be able to find whatever other destinations there are from there. Awesome. And I'll post links for that. So, John, thank you very much. And we'll talk soon. Josh, it's been a pleasure, man. Be well.